Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We are a webinar. Yes, we take that proudly. <laughs> we'll say it. Um, we broadcast, um, so we're an online show, broadcast online. Um, we The live show is done um, live on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's okay. We um, record the show every week and then do post it to our website later. And I'll show you at the end of today's show, <coughs> excuse me, where you can see all of those previous recordings and where today's recordings will go. Um, both the live show and the recorded sessions are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with any of your um, uh, friends, neighbors, family, colleagues, anybody who might be of interest in, in any, of our, any of our shows. Um, our, our focus is on libraries, of course. Everything is library related, services provided to libraries, service things libraries could be doing, resources they could um, have access to. Um, runs the whole gamut of all types of libraries, public, academic, school, um, special libraries, um, not really a lot of um, specifics there. Um, basically just libraries is our focus. So there could be some things that we do, like for example, today's show, could um, anybody you know may be interested in this and want to uh, go to your library to access these resources. Um, we do a mixture of things on here, here, here on Encompass Live, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Um, and we have um, guest speakers sometimes come in and sometimes we have commission staff. And today we have one of our commission staffs. Staffs, <laughs> staff. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Schultz here is our director of our talking book and braille service. Um, Good morning, please be here. Which is um, across the hall from us here. Yeah. We call it the West Wing. Oh, yeah, I guess I'm the yeah. West Wing. Yeah. It's, it's another area, <laughs> another office space to the west of us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's going to talk to us today about um, new things coming in um, talking books and how you can use yeah. the, the program. And um, there's a whole bunch of things. So I'll just yeah. hand it over to you to take it okay. away. Um, we've got the keyboard here and, and the great. mouse, if that works for you, depending, depending on what you're doing. Excellent. Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I thought I'd start with just a quick overview of uh, what we do with the Talking Book and Braille service, just in case anyone uh, tuning in isn't aware. And then I'll talk about some uh, some recent changes that we've had and uh, new things that we anticipate coming up relatively soon. And then I have a, a little PowerPoint presentation at the end that kind of attempts to answer some questions that I've gotten from librarians over the last oh, year, year and a half or so, mm -hmm. um, where we'll occasionally get calls from um, universities, for example. Mm -hmm. We'll call in wondering what to do about getting um, textbooks for school, um, oh, audio yeah. versions made quickly and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, which we don't do in-house, but we do know where to send people. Mm -hmm. So um, I've kind of tried to make a, a PowerPoint that um, helps people to kind of get in into the shoes of people who um, either have recently developed visual impairments such that they can't use regular print um, or have been you know, blind from a very young age and, and need different types of resources. Um, because there are a lot of different agencies that sort of work together collaboratively to create, um, to sort of replicate the world of print in alternative formats. That's going to depend on what their situation is right. and why they have the, the, the um, reading issue. Absolutely. Could be physical, could be um, mm -hmm. uh, the eyesight. It's, yeah, right. There's lots of different yeah, it, it really does vary. And so for um, just a general overview, um, so the, the Talking Book and Braille Service has been part of the Library Commission since about 1952. Um, we're part of a nationwide network of cooperating libraries um, that all um, sort of collaborate with the National Library Service, which is a division of the Library of Congress uh, that in the early 1930s was sort of charged with coming up with alternative formats. Um, initially just for blind people, and then over time, um, for blind adults, I should say, as well. Mm -hmm. um, over time, they added um, blind children and then people with physical disabilities that made it so that they can't use regular print. Um, right. For example, not being able to hold a book or turn its pages. Um, we do serve people um, temporarily sometimes as well, like if, if someone has had um, a medical procedure and has to take a medication that causes blurred vision for a certain period of time, um, they can sign up and, and use the service you know, during the period that they need it. Um, so there, there are a lot of different things that bring people to us. Um, dyslexia as well um, is, is a qualifying factor. Mm -hmm. And um, we serve people um, all over the state of Nebraska. Um, we mail books back and forth through the mail, and we also have some, some ways that you can access materials online, which I'll go over some of those. 
Um, right now we serve about 3,500 people all over the state. Um, so we provide what are called talking books, which I guess is obvious by the, the name of the service. Um, <laughs> um, essentially, they're, they're audio books. Um, they're in a specialized format that has some enhanced navigational features. Um, we also can circulate Braille books um, and several different types of Braille for children, like print Braille books that have um, the, the regular print and illustrations and then Braille overlay sheets so that um, children can learn Braille or um, at the same time as their parents may be learning it as well, um, using books like that. Um, the books circulate, um, for, for those who haven't seen it, let me try to hold this up yeah, camera right here. Um, this is a digital talking book player, and um, the player, uh, we send these out for free to anyone who's using the service. Um, they're very easy to use. Um, the user guide is built into it, so either you plug the machine in or just find just the one power button, which I'll push here. So they do have battery. Player mm -hmm. on. Press any button to learn about its function. So from here, once the machine is on, you can just push buttons and the buttons will tell you what they do. So it's very easy to use. I'll just press the play button here for a moment. Play, stop. To start or stop playing a book, use the large play stop button. When the book is playing, press this same button to stop the player. When you press play again, the machine will, will talk for a while. Okay. There. So I'll stop it for now. But you can go through the whole machine that way, and it'll it'll train you on how to use it just by pushing the buttons. And yeah, nice. as Chris mentioned, it has battery, actually excellent battery life too, compared to the cassette players that we used to have. Gosh, the battery charge on those at the very absolute best was eight to ten hours when they were mm -hmm. brand new. Um, these machines generally run somewhere around twenty nine to thirty hours oh, nice. um, on a battery, and the battery seems to last well. Just from the ones that have been coming back, probably in the neighborhood of six years or so. Um, so they're an awfully so nice that's battery. that's how long we've had these. Yeah, machines. we started circulating them in two thousand ten, okay. and two thousand eleven is when the really heavy push. They pretty much everyone started by then. Because they had to switch over from the cassettes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, the batteries have lasted you know a very long time for for a battery somewhere in the neighborhood of two hundred to three hundred charges. So yeah, they've been really great. You know, between the battery technology having improved over time and the fact that the machine doesn't have any moving parts, which helps a lot with battery life. This you know, with the cassette sure. player, you have that motor mm -hmm. you know, grinding away to keep those cassettes moving. And with this, um, the only thing that I guess would add to the charge that it's using is turning up the volume a little louder, I guess. But other than that, it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, the books that we circulate are on a specialized cartridge. Um, it's it's just a essentially a flash drive in a specialized shape, and um, they only fit in the machine one way. And um, you pop it in, and it'll play an entire book. And then the navigation features that are added to these will allow you to move, um, depending on the material and how it's how it's been marked up um, between different sections. Um, say in a fiction book, typically would be between parts and chapters. Um, in a nonfiction book, it could go into you know, some levels of depth beyond that. Or say a cookbook, you could go between major sections like uh, appetizers, breads, mm -hmm. entrees, desserts, um, into individual recipes, and then all the way down to the ingredient level, things like that. So there, it's a very sophisticated form of navigation. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're in a book club, you can also hit the mark button and add bookmarks, which is kind of fun. Oh, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's a very easy machine. Just pop it in, and uh, this is a text the book caught off of the, the audio presses here this morning. So. The New Odyssey, the story of the 21st century refugee crisis by Patrick Kingsley, DB87655, copyright 2017 by the Guardian, so Library of Congress Annotation, Contents, Prologue, Prologue, Wednesday, 15 April 2015. Yeah, so you can navigate through mm -hmm. fairly quickly that way too. Yeah. So just wanted to show that to, to mm -hmm. people in case you haven't seen one. Um, so that's mostly what we circulate to people. Um, the books go back and forth um, through the mail as free matter for the blind. So there's no cost to patrons to use the service at all. Sorry for um, the return postage or anything. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally free. Um, and also people who are comfortable downloading books, um, we do have a website that NLS has created called BAR. Uh, that stands for Braille and Audio Reading Download. Um, people can sign up to get a login and password for BARD, and then you can download books either to a blank cartridge, um, or the, you can use a regular flash drive. There's a little USB drive inside of the machine. You can use those on as well. Um, so that's another way of using the, the service. Do we, have, do we show that through the, um, how we have access to it from, I can show that, yeah. from books in Braille? Yeah, if you're, if you're on our website, um, you can just go over to uh, this, this bottom item in the menu on the left um, is the button books and Braille section. Mm -hmm. And then you can go over to so the main page here. This has just a good overview of uh, what we have. And uh, I'll talk about our mobile here in a moment. 
Um, new titles have come in, um, show up in this right column that we have over here. Um, but you can get to the application forms to sign up to use the service um, from here. Um, Bard, I believe there is a link directly to Bard from here. Um, you do need a password and log in to use Bard. Um, the whole service is kind of a, I guess you could say, a closed system. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with copyright protection. Um, mm -hmm. We're able to make recordings and circulate recordings of pretty much anything that's published in the United States um, outside of dramatic works with like plays. We can't do. Um, but any, any typical books or magazines, fiction, nonfiction, doesn't matter. Um, we can make specialized versions of them and they have to circulate to people just within um, the, the system of the service mm -hmm. um, to protect copyright. So, so each state has their own talking book and braille service generally exactly. that yep. to cover their mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Is it the, that digital download right above the picture, is that the link to Bard or is that? Um, um, yes, I believe that would be. Yeah, so this, will, sure. okay. this will take you right to Bard. Um, I can show you what it looks like here quickly. Um, BARD is a little bit difficult to use for some people, and that's actually one of the news items I have here. There's a new version of BARD. Um, it takes a while to set up, so I didn't want to put it on this computer, but uh, it's called BARD Mobile. Um, once you've downloaded that, it, it uh, mimics the way that you can download books to a mobile device. We have uh, an iOS app and a, uh, it's still a, um, and a, a Droid app that people can use um, to access things. So it's similar to those. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. So, um, oh, that didn't work well. Let's try it right down here. Looks like that's okay. There we go. Yeah. So, from the main page of Bard, um, the simplest way to use this is you can just uh, search the collection by entering either a title or author in there, we'll bring up all kinds of things from there. Um, you can browse um, by author's last name with letters through this buyout menu, um, you know, for titles here, and then we have a number of subject headings that you can access directly from here. Um, what a lot of people like to do, a lot of people that, that use BARD end up downloading quite a lot of material, so they keep up with new materials that are added pretty frequently. Um, so one of the things that people will do is just go to new materials and read through those really quickly. See what's the most recent things have been added. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So this will put in things that have been added in the last week or so, typically show up on here. Um, this we yeah, 51 in the last week here. So uh, for audio materials, new um, AARP bulletin, American Heritage, American History, um, analog science fiction, as well as science fiction. Um, and then we pass mm -hmm. the magazines here, we should go to some books as well. Or maybe I just went to the magazine section here. But at any rate, you can get to a number a number of materials very quickly that way. Um, there's also a drop down menu for oh yeah, I on those recent mm -hmm. issues for so yeah, that was the magazines. Um, you can go directly to magazines, so if you need to access a back issue, you can go there as well. Um, so it's it's fairly simple. Um, on the mobile side of things, um, it is a little bit easier once you have a login and password for your mobile device. You don't have to continue to enter your login and password. It will remember those. And you can put things in a wish list and download them. And kind of a new thing for talking book services is that if you have a mobile device, like a, a Droid phone or, or an iPhone, you can actually listen to the materials directly on the device. Nice. Nice. Um, historically, because of that specialized format issue, there wasn't really a way to do that. So you had to have a special player from us to, to listen to the books at all. Um, now with the mobile apps, you can actually listen to them. Uh, works better with headphones, of course, because the speakers and the mobile devices are Exactly Not that great, yeah. But, <laughs> but a lot um, of people listen to audiobooks now, so it's a yeah, similar thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it is it's very similar to using order to add really mm -hmm. So um so that's one of the new things I was gonna mention here too. Um yeah, you had a link to that on the um Yeah, I think Bard Mobile Manager is probably on our main page or somewhere. Uh, I'm sure going to go to the main page, I think there was yeah, that is the yep, main there it is. Yeah, exactly. So you can you can download Bard Mobile. Um, to use on your computer, and it, it basically mimics the way that the Droid app works um, almost yeah. identically. So you go to Google Play, to Google Play. Um, you can download this, but you actually use it on a PC, you not have to use it on, mm -hmm. on a mobile device necessarily. So um, it was actually designed by the husband of a patron in California yeah. who just felt like Bard was a little bit too complicated for a lot of users. And so um, having seen the mobile device uh, downloading system and how much smoother it is, they decided to do that. Um, using Bard in the traditional way, you download the book, and then you have to basically create a zip file that you have to unzip, 
how do you use a folder with a bunch of tiny little files in it, and that has to be kept just as it is and copied over to your cartridge to play. And um, whereas with this, you just download it and you don't have to worry about user file management. It just kind of takes care of all that stuff for you. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been a really nice help. Um, as far as other new things coming up, um, well, I guess I should mention um, it's been it's been a little while since I've been up in Encompass Five. Mm -hmm. um, I did become the director officially in January of this year, so that yep. was really new. Our um, biggest director retired, Gabe. Yes, <laughs> yeah, 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 Dave, if you're if you're out there, hello. Um, and um, there was a really cool um, happening in dyslexia in Nebraska this year. Um, there was a, a bill LB six forty five, uh, which was passed in this this year's uh, state legislative session. And essentially, that adds a definition of dyslexia to state statute um, related to education. Um, basically, the intent of it was to lay a foundation for um, what to do in terms of early identification and intervention for dyslexic students. Um, the definition that they added um, defines dyslexia as having a physical origin in the brain, which is important for talking book and braille services because mm -hmm. um, for us to be able to serve people with dyslexia, um, some of the legal use involves this notion of organic dysfunction, so that it has to be a, a physical handicap of some sort mm -hmm. um, that, have, that can be traced to a physical manifestation or organic dysfunction. Um, that does dovetail nicely with the definition that they put into Nebraska State Statute. And so over time, what we're hoping is that as we work with other organizations like the Nebraska Dyslexia Association, we'll hopefully be able to nurture some relationships that bring more dyslexic um, students and adults as well mm -hmm. um, to the service because we're, we're here to help them and, and mm -hmm. we're happy to serve you know, many more people in, among the dyslexic population. So we're looking forward to maybe being able to help um, you know, especially students initially with, with their reading needs and, and uh, get books out there to them. Um, we have a new OPAC, which is kind of cool too. I can't demonstrate that unfortunately because you have to have a special login thing that only works downstairs. <laughs> um, but there, we can sign patrons up so that they can get access to an OPAC that works, uh, like a true OPAC that interact, um, interacts directly with our circulation system. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, um, our computer team here at the commission made a, a really cool OPAC for us um, that sort of looks at, at data and allows people to kind of email us a list of things that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this new system will allow them to actually put um, requests directly into patron files um, by, by you know, patron doing Takes out the need for a middle person to right. data entry that I guess exactly. is Exactly. Yeah, that can, that can be really helpful, especially for borrowers who borrow a lot. Or, you know, a lot of times we, we find that friends and family members of patrons will use the OPAC. Um, and the patron, yeah, the, the patron might have said, like, you know, I'd like to have all the John Griffin books, um, but they don't use computers frequently, and so they'll have you know, like a friend or a, a, a child of theirs or something, someone uh, mm -hmm. go ahead and get on there and, and take care of that for them. Um, another interesting thing from the last um, about a year and a half or so is Unified English Braille has become the new standard for Braille across the United States. Um, essentially, it's, it's pretty similar to grade two English Braille, which has been the standard since about 1933, um, but it updates it to, um, well, let's see, essentially you're trying to unify some, some international differences between Braille code, and then also dealing with simple representation of some modern advancements since it hasn't been updated since 1933. <laughs> it didn't have a lot, well, it's been updated, I guess, but not yeah. comprehensively so. Um, but it deals with things like simple representation of web URLs and things like that, which you know nowadays come up a lot in print, um, and they were kind of clunky in Braille, so it, it makes those things a little bit smoother. Um, NLS, as they uh, produced Braille starting last January, they uh, are producing things entirely in UVT. So I mean, one of their few patients, they're having a great difficulty with it. Um, it's it's slightly different. So is it a big change for them? Yeah, not, not terribly so. Um, there's a teeny bit of a learning curve, depending on, like, if, I suppose, if you're reading, like, say, Wired magazine, you're going to learn about the URL differences really quickly, oh, uh, yeah. things like that. Um, other things, works of fiction, you probably won't notice a, a tremendous amount of difference right off the bat, but um, there's support out there too to help with um, very many other differences. Um, and this year was the official end of the cassette era as of June. Um, NLS asked us to send back all the cassette players. So, uh, we, that was the, the box, you have the blue boxes now, yes. that was the old green boxes, yeah, right? Yeah, the green. Everything with the shells <clears throat> used to be all full of green and now they're all blue. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah, those green boxes and, uh, and all those uh, sort of 1970s looking gauge mm -hmm. set players, oh, yeah. um, they went back to um, be recycled um, in June. Um, we still had quite a few here, there was about five, 
just under 600 machines uh, here that we sent for recycling. And we also have a few patients who use them. You know, anytime you make a change to a new technology, uh, there are some people that just really like the technology that they're using and, and continue to hold on to it. And that's fine. Those so are there, I mean, if people do prefer that, they're still supporting it in some way? Or I mean, what are well, they, they eventually they're going to have to. They're, yeah, basically, yeah. Um, most of the books are gone, um, and they've all been converted to the digital format, so they're available that way. Um, we do have some Nebraska titles that people can still get on cassette, but yeah, the cassette, the parts to repair the machines are, are gone. Right. Um, so as, as the once machines they're break, gone, once they break down, that's it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. And of course, we had record players before cassette players, and mm -hmm. I still, every once in a while, we get one of those back in the mail, so we can send one back. So they're still out there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, commercial audiobooks have been a neat thing over the last couple of years. Um, generally speaking, the materials that we get from the National Library Service are recorded um, by contractors that NLS um, works with to do the recordings. They usually have three or four contractors at the time. Um, we produce about 2,000 books a year uh, for the, the programs all over the country. Um, in the last two years, though, they've uh, worked out some deals with several commercial audiobook publishers who are now giving their audio files to the NLS contractors. So rather than having to record them, they just have to do a little navigation markup to them, um, convert the audio file into the digital talk book format, and then duplicate them and send them out to us. Mm -hmm. um, so what that's meant is that we get about an additional thousand books per year. So uh -huh. going from 2,000 to 3,000 a year has been you know, tremendous. Uh, a tremendous benefit. And I just think too, I think the cartridges or these, it's they take up less space than the old they cassette do. Absolutely. boxes and everything, so we can fit more on our shelves. Absolutely, yeah, we can fit more on the shelves. And for patrons with cassettes, the trick having that many more, I was like, wow, where are you going to put all those? <laughs> right, uh, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I am actually. I know you were doing some sort of shift. I'm just starting to shift. About recently, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it, it did mess up our shifting plans, <laughs> but that's okay. That's that's, uh, that's a good reason you have to shift. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's that's been that's been really helpful. Um, in the studios, let's see, we've been playing around with some uh, deep breathing software, which sounds very scary, but um, <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing. Um, in our recording studios uh, here in, in Lincoln, we record um, a number of magazines. We're around a couple dozen right now, 22, if I remember right. And um, books of either about Nebraska and the Great Plains or Nebraska authors, um, that sort of thing. Um, we have a couple dozen volunteers that come into the recording studios each week for 90 minute or two hour sessions mm -hmm. and work with our staff on making those recordings. And um, a lot of the volunteers, um, they're not professional narrators, of course, it's a volunteer position. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to be, you know, retired professors or uh, teachers, librarians, uh, that sort of thing. And so they're excellent readers, but they may not have the most perfect voices in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, um, mm -hmm. breathing sounds can be distracting sometimes. Mm -hmm. Someone might be an excellent reader and we're, you know, related to work with them, but we do get some sort of uh, kind of sounds here and there. Um, so we've been playing with this new software that can remove or proportionally reduce the sounds of breathing. Um, great how yeah. technology comes up with these things. So uh, yeah, we've had some pretty good luck working with it. I'm trying to find some good general settings. And yeah, it just helps the recording sound just a little bit better. So it may be one of those things that we just sort of notice it because we're working so carefully on post-production to make the recording sound as good as possible. Yeah. Um, but it'll definitely help to, uh, to really keep that going. Um, I wanted to mention for, um, for any of you who are tuning in, we're going to the NLA and SLA conference next week. Um, there will be a TBBS-related presentation that our readers of Magic and Suite will be doing. Um, it's called Non-Visual Desktop Access NVDA for All. And what that has to do with is there's a free screen reader for Windows called NVDA. And um, it's, it's fairly easy to use. Um, you don't need all the tech support stuff, the JAWS or the complexity of it. Mm -hmm. And so her presentation is really neat. I was looking at some of the info for it yesterday. And it'll show people how easy this is to use and train people to use NVDA. And also how to set up a visual impairment computer station in your library on a very, very tight budget. Oh, um, nice. yeah. She had some price ranges in like the three, three to one hundred dollar range to make a really nice comprehensive setup. I know because a lot of that equipment can be pricey. Exactly. We did it as part of um, our previous uh, VTAP grant. Right. We did some ADA specific workstations, and that exactly. was a, a big and because we had grant money, we were able to right. get that into some of the libraries. Right. They would never have been able to do it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah draws is in, in and of itself very, very expensive. And then the, what was in there? You talked about the, uh, the dragon. The dragon, the yeah, dragon actually speaking, yeah. yeah. So yeah, a lot of those things individually are very expensive. And um, if you if you find that, that those aren't working for you or they're updating it and it's becoming a chore, 
um, this this presentation will give you some some other options to consider yeah. um, that are really inexpensive too, so, um, but also work very very well. So that'll be on Thursday at the conference, from three to four. If anyone's interested, so I, I didn't want to mention that. Uh, and then just just to mention a few things that are coming up in the future. Um, the first of them is uh, duplication on demand is is uh, starting to be tested. Um, we're ready to join the second wave. It'll probably be of uh, pilot testers for this. Um, what this entails is. Um, as things are now, as, as Chris mentioned before, um, we have shelf after shelf full of talking mm -hmm. books. And so, um, as things are now, in the morning, uh, we run mail cards uh, that tell us what books people need, um, uh, books that were returned to us yesterday were checked in, and that causes more books to be ready for those people the next day. Mm -hmm. And so, we'll go through in the morning and pull the books that people need and get those into mail bags and deliver to them um, in a few days from now. Um, over time, however, they're testing this concept of duplication on demand, and what that will be is that rather than printing mail cards and pulling books, we'll print mail cards that tell us what books to make copies of. So they'll send us um, a special duplication station um, where we can duplicate, I believe it's 15 books at a time, um, and it's sort of an automated process where it will print out the mail card, um, start to copy that person's cartridge, and then it'll also produce a manifest that will tell the duplication what's on that cartridge. Mm -hmm. So um, it's still kind of in the test phase. Um, NLS will be providing the libraries that, that do this test with the duplication and printing equipment to try it. Um, and we're definitely looking forward to giving it a try. Um, assuming it works well, and uh, the first phase, I've heard pretty positive things so far from the, the I think there's eight libraries testing it right now. Are these the cartridges? Are those read recordable? So they are. Uh, yeah. If you've, you you uh, think this particular book that's on this mm -hmm. one, New Odyssey, if that needed to be used for some other title or for yeah, reason. Um, yeah, they can be used uh, basically similar to a typical flash drive. So okay. um, yeah. it depends on the I guess the quality of the flash memory that they're using. Yeah. But it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of you know five hundred to five thousand. Know, pretty big window there, but mm -hmm. even five hundred duplications is not. Yeah, yeah. So they'll, they'll last you know, quite a few years typically. Um, so we eventually we'll probably shift toward making those sorts of custom cartridges. Uh, the other advantage of that is that we can put multiple books on a cartridge for pa patrons who are oh. interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than just having uh, one book per cartridge, um, if you press and hold the play stop button on the machine, it will take you into what's called the bookshelf. And in the bookshelf area, you can go back and forth and choose between basically however many materials fit on the cartridge memory lines. So mm -hmm. you could have you know just two books or maybe 50 magazines or you know, whatever work out um, based on the one cartridge for people that way. Um, so hopefully we'll start playing with that early next year. And um, if that goes well, um, it'll kind of have an effect on that shelving stuff. You know, we'll be um, probably dedicating an area just to materials to use for duplication on demand. Um, and still, of course, having physical copies um, during some sort of transitional period too. Um, we're also making some uh, changes to our website. Um, so nothing that anyone will really see directly, but in the talking book and growth section of the website, um, Amanda, again, our reader supervisor, who's doing this presentation next week, um, is working on some sort of back-end changes that will make that part of the website work even faster and more conveniently with screen readers. Ah, uh, so that'll, that'll kind of speed things up a little bit. Um, the, the whole site, of course, is you know, ADA compliant, but there are always some little tweaks you can do to make it quicker. Oh, right? Yeah, make it um, work easier, yeah. Right, yeah, kind of get to the information you, that you're really looking for more quickly. Um, so we're, we're implementing those. I think some of those are already up, and the rest of them should be up by, well, by the conference. So, so, those, uh, show off, yeah. Yeah. so those, those are very quick. Um, as far as future things that we're hearing about from NLS, um, the next NLS conference is in June of next year in Nashville. Um, at these uh, biennial conferences, they kind of show all the regional libraries, the new technology that's coming out, and let us get some hands-on demonstrations and progress reports on what's happening. Um, the big two that we're hearing about right now are they're looking at a, a the new generation of this player. Um, we've been uh, distributing this digital talking book player since about 2010, mm -hmm. and um, the new one, the main difference that we're hearing about is they're trying to add some sort of wireless connectivity to the machine. Mm -hmm. um, we're not sure if that will happen through, um, I mean, it could happen through cellular connectivity or maybe through Wi-Fi or some mm -hmm. combination of that. Um, not quite sure how that's going to go yet, um, but they're working on creating something with that. Um, and actually, we, we are, there, there's a very, very, very early pilot, um, probably not even technically at the alpha stage yet, um, called MOCA. Um, which I can't even remember what that acronym stands for. But um, the the Mocha test is due to start in a week or two. Um, that's going to be some sort of custom device that we're not even sure what it looks like. They're going to send it to us um, probably in the next week or two, and 
it will allow us to try some sort of wireless downloading that goes through the BARD website. Mm -hmm. um, it's it sort of self-destructs after I think two gigabytes of, of memory being used, presumably because it's using some sort of cellular data that um, to allocate mm -hmm. to us. Um, and so all the test ones. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So once the test is done, then I guess we send that device back to them. But uh, at this stage, they're just mm -hmm. kind of uh, just testing the waters a little bit, I guess, just to see um, what we like about the, the general concept and what sort of um, problems we might encounter. So that as they get into the design phase of actually making the machine, they can take some of those things mm -hmm. um, into consideration and make it better. Yeah, so, I'm sure a lot of people <coughs> with so many things coming on your cell phones now and being available right. wirelessly and the audiobooks being able to download directly. They want to, you know. I'm sure they've got people asking. You know, oh yeah, absolutely. Where, where's this? Why can't we do it with this? We can do it right. with this. You know, we can do this with overdrive. Why? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So over time, it'll be interesting. I, I get the impression that it'll the system could work kind of similar to say an Amazon Kindle, mm -hmm. where um, if you if you thought of readers' advisors as being in the position of Amazon, um, where the you know, patrons can still call, talk to them, interact with them, email them. Um, you know, help with reading preferences and get those sorts of things narrowed down, and then we can sort of push and pull books to them wirelessly where that's possible. Um, so over time, it's looking pretty likely that um, the, the concept of having finished books on the shelves ready to be pulled um, will probably transition, you know, we're looking maybe five years out, um, towards some sort of a, a hybrid process where a lot of material could be delivered wirelessly um, for folks who can't, for whatever reason, have access to using the wireless uh, mechanism. We can do the duplication on demand so it could pull things for them. And um, have maybe some books on the shelves would probably be more modest. Sure, so, yeah. yeah. So those are things um, quite a ways down the road, probably the core office would be implemented, but um, things to, to think about that are coming up. So, um, so yeah, I think that's, that's kind of where we're at for updates. So this next part is um, a PowerPoint thing. So um, apologies if you don't want to watch a PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, they're not my vacation slides, at least. So that's fine. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. And then if you go up to slideshow, you can do no on the PowerPoint in the center. Oh my! Oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah, okay. and then from the beginning, okay. all the way to the left. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. Then all right, full screen for you. Okay. So this presentation, um, like I said, I've, I've kind of put together just um, in response to um, a set of questions that people have asked over the last year and a half or so. Um, just trying to give people um, some sort of sense of. of getting in the shoes of, of a potential patron that would be of ours, but they're people that I think, you know, come into public libraries all over the all over the state, um, academic libraries as well as school libraries, and uh, it would be useful to um, um, kind of give people an overview of what we do and, and um, how, how we can help to support people in, in your area as well. Um, so we'll start with um, a couple quick statistics. Um, it's difficult to get exact numbers on, on the number of blind people per state. Um, I pulled some numbers. These are uh, a combination of information from the National Federation for the Blind, and I'm kind of looking at some uh, American Community Survey results that have a little bit of stuff. That the final census data doesn't really split things out with blindness per se. Um, most some of the American Community Survey um, statistics do have a little bit. So roughly speaking, there's probably somewhere um, just shy of 34,000 Nebraskans um, who have visual impairments. And we serve about 3,500. So again, you're always kind of looking at serving somewhere in the 10% range of people who might be able to use the service. Um, I pulled Missouri's numbers too, just to sort of see how we yeah, compare. Yeah. And we're actually, looks like we're slightly better statistically. So that's mm -hmm. good. Um, a lot of people are losing their vision you know, as part of the aging process. And you know, may not consider themselves blind, for example, too. So gathering things statistically can be kind of a challenge so because they they, they're that, still yeah. exactly like, for instance, they may not be able to read regular print well anymore, but they're maybe still doing other things with vision. So they're they're not thinking of things in terms of blindness. So um, that's a, a thing to consider that um, you may have people that come into the library who um, you may have seen for years and years that read lots of things, and they kind of switch to the large print section, mm -hmm. and then you start not seeing them come in as often and. You know, those are people who um, we'd be... You know, That's who to reach out for, too, for this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that, that definitely helps us a lot. Um, and looking at statistics for Braille readership, too, um, it's, it's been a, a period of decades where Braille readership has declined somewhat. So the percentage mm -hmm. of children who are learning Braille in school right now seems to be around 10%. Um, it's mostly due to mainstreaming of schools over time. Mm -hmm. um, 
that of course is problematic because when you look at statistics, uh, statistics that is for um, people employment, um, people who are blind who have jobs, 80% of them read and write very fluently um, because it really is a, a form of, um, shall we say, complete literacy that's different mm -hmm. than audio. Um, with the audio materials, you're able to keep up with print, um, but as far as making uh, writing, things, um, yeah. it doesn't give you that that half of the equation. So, um, reading and writing braille fluently is really important for that. Uh, the National Federation for the Blind, of course, um, it is you know constant and ongoing campaign to encourage people to read braille. So that's I grabbed the statistics about that from them, um, and that, that does show in our stats too. We we primarily do circulate audio materials. Um, we have a lot of real in-house for children and young adults, and then we contract um, with uh, Idaho, to, or sorry, Utah, to send us um, adult Braille. Um, we have a few dozen people who who um, use that. Um, you can also download Braille and put that on on a refreshable Braille display, which is a computer device um, that basically sells a, a sentence of Braille at a time, or a line of Braille at a time, a pop-up, and you can read that and then go to the next line and so forth. Um, we do have quite a few people um, who, again, the people who tend to be um, in, in working, employed, um, ordinarily younger folks relative to the, the average age of our patrons, um, do a lot of Braille downloading. So that's another thing to consider um, over time. Um, but, you know, the history of Braille is like looking at a very complex um, matrix of things. Like, imagine, if, if you can, um, having the what they call the war of the docks that was happening in the, the teens and 20s in the United States. Um, of, of these different um, so many different versions. Here, yeah, the, ultimately the war of the docks boiled down to three of these, uh, the New York Point system, American Braille, and English Braille. Um, ultimately, English Braille uh, won the battle of the docks back then and became kind of the standard. Um, but if you were blind at the time of going to school, you might have had to learn multiple systems to read the same thing. Yeah, read everything. Yeah, yeah, sort of like learning a foreign language, except that the words being represented are still in one language. Mm -hmm. um, so you're learning several different codes, essentially, for the same language. So um, it, it's, a, it's a complicated thing when you think about it. Um, mm -hmm. And Braille continues to be updated, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Unified English Braille has uh, now come into official use. Um, other things to consider, too, is um, there's a music code for musical notation, uh, which is fairly sophisticated just to represent, you know, simple musical activities. Um, there's a lot happening in a given musical composition that you, you might have on, say, if you're doing a piano part, you might have a, a bass and a treble line, um, chords being played at the same time, some notes being held over while other things are being played, and like a combination of legato and staccato lines. All those things have to be represented somehow in Braille. Um, which turns you know a measure into a page of braille sometimes depending on mm -hmm. how, how sophisticated yeah. you know, that particular measure is. Um, the Nemeth code is also still the go-to for mathematics. Um, that's kind of a whole separate um, system to learn. Um, it's also worth considering that there are several grades of braille. Um, student, students and people learning grade one braille um, are essentially learning letter by letter, but adult braille or grade two braille as it's known is contracted to save space. Um, that does make learning a little bit more difficult, mm -hmm. though, because now you have to memorize all these contractions as you're reading as well. Um, it's it's kind of like stenography, I guess, in a sense, where you're really going to be shorten up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it gets very difficult. And historically, these refreshable Braille displays for for downloading Braille, um, they work wonderfully, but they're very expensive. Um, yeah. They've they've typically floated between thirty five hundred dollars up to fifteen thousand dollars. I was wondering what that you described them, but they seem very high tech. Yes. That they wouldn't yeah. be something. Um, yeah. That's that's some cool news too that, that I didn't mention earlier, but again, sometime in that five year in the future range, um, NLS is doing a test right now at Perkins Library with a, a cheaper new model of a refreshable rail display cool. that might be economical enough that they can actually provide them to libraries so we can circulate them to patrons. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really looking forward to that. That'll, that'll help immensely with, with that kind of situation. Um, in terms of audio formats, um, we started on vinyl records um, back in the 30s and then transitioned into 70s to cassettes in, in 2010 to the digital talking book. And there are also um, different types of text-to-speech things that are out there, too. Um, I wanted to go over um, what a few of those things are. Um, this is something, you know, if you're watching this, I don't think you need to memorize all these different organizations, <laughs> but I just wanted to make people aware that um, when a patron, maybe somewhere else in the state, um, comes to a, a public library and is looking for some help, um, you can direct people to us and we can help, um, help them to find these different organizations. But this is kind of the... A, 
a sampling of the really cool matrix of different organizations that kind of all collaborate um, to provide reading materials to people who can't use regular print. Um, we are essentially um, the regional library in Nebraska for the Library of Congress National Library Service. Um, who all the stuff I've already shown you today is, is the types of materials we provide. Um, we essentially are trying to provide materials that would be pretty similar to what a public library would have. Um, have around around uh, let's see, seventy thousand titles available through us. Uh, the average public library has around ninety thousand titles. We have some uh, um, fast facts from uh, NCDS. Um, so we're somewhere in the neighborhood of what a typical public library would, would have for offerings. Um, with reading, it tends to focus on pleasure reading, uh, fiction and nonfiction. Um, the nonfiction tends to not be academic in nature, but more like um, biographies and histories and things like that. Um, other services that are out there, though, um, there's Bookshare, which is run by a company called Benetech. Um, they have a big uh, grant from the Department of Ed, mm -hmm. and they have a really giant number of books. I forget the number that they have right up hand. So it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000. Um, their books, however, are produced through text to speech, and so they don't aesthetically they don't sound as good. Um, text to speech has come a long way in the last few decades, but it's uh, it's still you can still tell you're listening to a, a robot voice, even if it sounds a little bit yeah. more human than it used to. Um, and you occasionally get mispronunciations and things like that. So um, it's really good though if you if you just need the material, it's it's a good go to to get the material quickly and, and be able to process it. Um, Newsline is a service that we actually try to sign people up for right away if you sign up for talking books through us. Um, Newsline focuses on newspapers, and newspapers are one of those things that we really can't keep up with because, you know, with the things that we record and that the Library of Congress has, mm -hmm. has recorded, um, they tend to be books and magazines that, you know, if you're recording a book, you record the book. If you're recording a magazine, you typically have a month or two in between issues to get it recorded. Right. Um, Newspapers, that's a daily. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's it's virtually impossible to keep up with them. Um, Newsline is accessible either online or through uh, telephone. And it's another text-to-speech thing where they, they work with different newspapers to get a special kind of text file that can be um, quickly used with this text-to-speech conversion to, to make versions that can be listened to. Um, I, again, either over the phone or on the internet. Uh, and they do make a digital talking book version of it too that can be downloaded and played on a cartridge if people would prefer to listen to it on a machine. So um, that's another um, service that we, we really try to sign people up for right away so that they have that kind of, again, the, com the complete sort of print literacy that they would expect to have um, when they were using regular print. You know, they can read their newspapers and also keep up with magazines and, and books um, all, all at the same time. Um, the radio talking book is kind of related to that too. Um, radio Talking Book is based out of Omaha, and they have uh, special radio devices that only pick up this one station that they broadcast on, um, and they can also be listened to online. Um, they too keep up with newspapers, and I guess you could say they're kind of a, a, a more state regional supplement to the newsline concept. Um, they do the World Herald and the Journal Star every day, and then they do some other newspapers um, from around the state, like uh, Columbus Telegram, uh, Norfolk. Uh, North Platte, places like that, where they, I think, once a week they cover um, some selections from these different regional newspapers um, to try to keep up with things like that, too. And they also do some books as well. Like, I know um, they were doing books as kind of a serialized thing for a while, where, like, um, their one book on Nebraska, um, we make those available through a, a cartridge. Um, for people who are using the radio talking book service, sometimes they like to listen to them in the serial thing, which is kind of fun. You'd say, you know, it's like you and a bunch of other people around the state are listening to the book at the same time. <laughs> Um, so yeah. I'll go through and, and do them that way in you know, an hour or two a week on that way. Um, Christian Record Services is a place that's based here in Lincoln, but it's a national service. Um, I think they focus on Seventh-day Adventist um, materials primarily, but they do a few magazines that are more um, interdenominational. Um, they're just, I, I put them on there because it's noteworthy that they're, they're right here in Nebraska, right here in Lincoln, in fact, um, and they too use the digital talk and book format. So um, when, we, when we made the change to this, they made the change to um, um, so it's kind of the, the standard for for the materials um, for for print disabilities at this point. Um, and commercial audiobooks are still very much part of the, the whole package. So I mean, if you have a patron um, who's using talking books, we certainly encourage them to use you know, commercial books, use overdrive, you know, anything that works for them. Um, and ebooks can be part of that too. Um, if people are downloading things to Kindles or Nooks that, that have the text to speech yeah, capability, to on, there, yeah. that's that's definitely part of part of the overall um, process. However, as this fellow's uh, backpack 
um, shows you using all these different devices with different specialized formats. That's a lot of different so, things yeah. to keep track of. Yeah. yeah. So this is one of the things that I wanted um, people out there just to kind of think about from from a patron perspective. Um, that it, it's difficult. Like you may be um, a person who's just recently lost enough vision that you can't use regular print, and suddenly you have multiple services to remember that have non-compatible formats, um, each requiring their own special device to play them. Um, some of them have weird sound quality issues, like the text-to-speech types of things. Mm -hmm. um, there's different learning curves for each one and different depths of those collections or different advantages of them. One fact, one I didn't mention, I'm going to go back a page for just a second here. Learning, yeah, I forgot to mention Learning Ally there, but that's, mm -hmm. that's an important one. Um, the Learning Ally folks focus on textbooks, and so that's the one yeah. where um, if students are looking for textbooks, they're the go-to for that. They, they do some regular recording and some text-to-speech, um, a combination of those to try to Get things to students as quickly as possible because you know every year they make a change to you know, the, the 17th edition of this free book A, you know, and so and you have to have that most recent one, otherwise, right. yeah, you right. won't really use the old one exactly. So that's very important, too. Uh, and then you know, modern user expectations can be an issue, too. Um, these apps have been wonderful for us for students, for example. Um, younger people, you know, even though the new digital talking book player looks much more contemporary than the, the old beige cassette players. It still is large and doesn't look like stuff that your friends have necessarily. So, you know, if you're a, a middle school or high school student, there was a certain stigma to having this machine that made you stand out as different. Um, with the new apps, if people are using an iPad or an iPhone or something, you can download things and listen to them directly on that device and, and get past that sort of um, the stigma of having something that makes you stick out. So that's that's been nice too. So, mm -hmm. so some of these complications are starting to resolve themselves. But it's an issue to, to think about that it's still out there. It um, is. Does remind me of those? I mean, it's similar to people without um, vision or you know disabilities that even we have various places to get books from. I mean, you right. can look in your public library, um, go online to Amazon, go to Barnes and Noble, and you're going to find different things in different places. Oh, yeah. And sometimes when I'm looking for a particular book of some sort, I will look in multiple ones to figure out where it's the easiest to get it from, where it's the cheapest to get it from, Maybe. who got the paperback rather than the, and it's not all the same. They don't all always right. have the same right. thing. Um, and do I want it in ebook format now too, which right. people just send to my tablets. Um, Absolutely. It's yeah. very similar it is. to what yeah. everybody is dealing with now that there's so many more That's options. very true, yeah. We live in the paradox of choice. Yes. Uh, yes, there's a lot of different ways to approach all these things, for sure. Um, using computers, which, again, uh, if you're at the conference, um, definitely check out Amanda's presentation next week mm -hmm. uh, that addresses some of these things. Um, using computers becomes uh, the need for adaptive technology. Um, people's first thought is usually screen magnification, which if people are just losing enough vision that they're not using regular print, that's, that is probably a good strategy to start with. Um, oftentimes people end up needing screen readers um, and using speech recognition um, devices or, or like uh, the Dragon program. Um, OCR readers are still out there and uh, currency readers. The, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing has made a currency reader. Um, actually, there's two now. There's a physical one that patrons of ours can, can sign up and get. They go through the Bureau of Engraving and Printing now to get mm -hmm. them. Um, but there's also an app that can be downloaded directly um, that anyone can download that and mm -hmm. you, you just Point it, you know, point, point your camera, camera to yeah. see which, which bills you have. Um, I, I've tried it and it's it's accurate. So I was kind of hoping it might turn some of my ones in hundred. <laughs> it didn't work, so it's it worked well instead. So uh, so that was good. So those are those are some of the things you need to consider there. Um, some of the tricks with computers to think about though, um, maintaining them like some of the PTOP grant material over long periods of time. It can get expensive and prone to obsolescence as programs change and shift over time. Mm -hmm. um, there are some connectivity issues, especially in rural areas or out of the home, where people have to consider using those things. Um, it can require some training um, in terms of how complex some of those interfaces are. When you think about the, you know, someone that's learning to use a computer, now you have this whole secondary level of, of learning to relearn how to use the computer because you have a, a visual understanding of how it's been working, and now you need a non-visual mm -hmm. um, interpretation of that. Um, it's worth considering that uh, the visual impaired, impairment population tends to lean toward toward the elderly, um, again, just because age-related age um, issues bring up visual impairments. Um, and that means that there's usually a competing focus for people who are, are newly or recently blinded. Mm -hmm. um, they're thinking about things like orientation and mobility, like how are they going to get around town or even just up and down the street. Um, new ways of, of strategizing how they're going to cook and maintain their homes. Um, taking the proper medications when you when you can't use visual identification, 
Um, and they may have other health issues to contend with at the same time as well. So it's one of those things where we are very sensitive to that here. And when people um, contact us to, to initialize service, that's, that's the thing that you know, we always keep in mind is that oftentimes you're, you're uh, helping someone um, who's used to doing things visually but is, is now struggling to do that. And um, they have a lot of things on their mind. So we, we want to make sure that um, that complicated matrix of all those different services that I showed before, um, we want to make that as easy as possible for them and, and you know, try to get materials um, prepared for them with a minimum of effort on their part so they can just get what they need uh, without having it's to It's very different when you haven't been blind or visually impaired from, from birth or from right. very young. That's right. That it's a whole different way of having to learn everything. Yeah. yeah. And that is the thing to consider that most of the patrons that we serve um, at the average ages in the mid 80s at this point. Mm -hmm. And so you, you do tend to see, you know, people who are, are reasonably blinded. Um, although we do have a lot of people who, who have been with us their whole lives um, mm -hmm. um, that are even in that age bracket too. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, so, you know, it's a service where, you know, we try to provide what the what that particular patron's needs are, just, just like any public library. So mm -hmm. um, you have some students and you have, you have some, some older folks and all kinds of people in between that, that mm -hmm. have different needs. And so, um, we do try to be especially sensitive, though, to, to some of the complications of people who are older and recently blind sure. because they, they do have um, a lot to think about, and they, they want their machines, um, they want their reading to be as easy as possible. So if we can set it up so that it's fairly turnkey, um, we have a conversation with them and make sure we know who their favorite authors are and their favorite subjects, and the machine is super easy to use, and we can just send it right after them and things work right away. So, um, so that's something we consider. And accessible web design too. I think most public libraries have done a good job of, of uh, mm -hmm. keeping up with um, proper design standards to do that. Um, if anyone is interested, the, the WCAG standards. Um, there's a, a link on the. the a lot of your um, web, um, like WordPress or your your actual base of your websites, they have that kind of thing built in, so right. you can click to make sure that it is. Yeah. Or don't forget that this is something you might want to look into as you're designing your site yeah. to add this, you know, app or something, or add this uh, plugin right. to help. Uh, yeah. Yeah. To really make sure, yeah, make sure to check that stuff. Yeah. Because yeah. you you do want to make sure it works. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, important to uh, let's see a couple. Wasn't sure how much time we have. No, we're good. We started a little late because of us, so we will oh. go until until sure. you're done. Okay. Um, yeah, so with um, things to consider for accessibility in libraries, um, if you're a member of the, the NLA or the ALA, consider ASCLUG, um, which is the, the, the working group for uh, specialized libraries. Um, they deal with a lot of visual impairment issues as well as other, other impairments. Um, great group for thinking through um, different things in terms of public libraries and, and uh, even, even physical design and, um, you know, like how you might lay out a large print area maybe a little differently than the rest of your library to make it easier to, to even access the materials, you know, from the spine as well, or face things as much as possible, things like that. Um, the Marrakesh Treaty, I wanted to mention in here, um, the United States has yet to ratify this, but what that has to do with is it's a, a consortium of countries around the world, I think 20, 20 something signed on now, um, the U.S. not being one of those, unfortunately, um, so far. Um, but the idea behind the Marrakesh Treaty is it's to allow the exchange of foreign language materials between countries in these specialized formats for print disabilities. Um, what that means is that once the U.S. Really signs on to that, um, we would be able to get materials um, in foreign languages, but also English language materials from places like Ireland and the U.K. and things like that. Um, that will be Canada even as well. Um, we have occasional um, specific agreements, but it goes back to that copyright stuff where um, the materials that we circulate have to be published in the United States, and if they're not published in the United States and yet popular, we can't do anything about it. So, um, the Marrakesh Treaty will help to simplify those laws by kind of creating a, a common sense solution to um, exchange those things among um, programs similar to ours all over the world. So, and I just want to remind people that you know, there really is an intellectual freedom issue, like right, to make sure that people um, have access to materials and that the accessibility pathways to those materials are working. Um, the, the slogan of the Library of Congress, um, National Library Service section, has always been that all may read. Yeah, I like and, that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, it really does speak to, to what we do. So this is their, their new logo here, too. So you have um, NLS and Braille, and I love that they have a little speaker audio uh -huh, to the NLS. Yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of fun. So 
Well, did anybody have any questions out there? Or? Um, that, you know, I can't remember you're talking. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and type them into your GoToWebinar questions section, um, or say I have a microphone, you can ask your question that way. Um, ask about, any, about anything that he's um, talked about today, or if you have any questions about um, using these kind of services in your library, um, how would you do it? Do, they, do you have anybody that you know of that might be um, you'd be able to um, help out with this? But I think some things that some people don't um, assume about, that, that they do assume about this, is that it's, it's just for people who are physically, just, just blind, that's it, it's right. a visual impairment, and they've been that way forever. Right. Um, as you said, your age of your patrons happens to be about average age 80, but right. Right. Um, Thing that I learned about it was that it's not just about that if there is some uh, you are eligible for this program if there's some physical reason why you mm -hmm. like I I was in an accident and even temporarily and I mm -hmm. can't use my arms to hold a book Absolutely. Um, I'm so it's, it's something like that you can sign up for, that, for this program mm -hmm. and just temporarily have access to it until you're healed up with and mm -hmm. everything so Absolutely. it's anything that could impede your ability to read. Absolutely. And you got to kind of think big about that, not Very just think, oh, we have the old people coming in who yeah. are losing their sight. It's mm -hmm. beyond that. Yeah. And it's it's available for anybody who has anything like that right. now. Yeah, it's important to think that yeah, blind, blindness is more of like a spectrum, a visual impairment that mm -hmm. um, anyone within that spectrum um, may have issues with, with print. Uh, and yeah, with, with things like accidents, and, mm -hmm. um, and we even have things for people who who uh, don't have the use of their hands. For example, we have things like sip puff controllers that can be sent to them oh, um, yeah. to control the machine stopping and starting. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there, there so are a lot of people who are like in wheelchair or paralyzed or something. Yes, or... absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a high volume machine that we can order that people can listen to if they have um, a lot of hearing loss as well. Um, mm -hmm. They can plug headphones into this, and it's much much. Like the other issues related mm -hmm. that you might be having yeah. other medical issues. With. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we we really try to. There's lots to of keep things. Things. Yeah. Yeah. So just think of anybody who might have any big reason why they have difficulty reading and right. reach out to Scott and say, hey, will this count? Can we help them? <laughs> what Absolutely. can we do? Yeah. And I liked, really like your example of you've had somebody who's been coming into the library forever. Right. They read like they read voraciously. You notice they're reading the large print. Mm -hmm. And so you can see something is changing, what kind of books right. they're they're get selecting and mm -hmm. or if they're fading out of using the library right. because no one can't see anymore reach out to them and say there's there's options right. you're not you're not you're not at, lo at a loss right. yeah yeah and honestly even when they're just in a large print section um the, that's the, the time standards, to reach out to them. It, that's really the time yeah um we we can serve anyone who can't see to read what's considered regular print Mm -hmm. um, which is um, print below 14 point which is oh, pretty small so yeah. I mean, large print um, that that is basically the dividing line. Like once someone is is into the point where they're only using large print, um, you know, having to be able to call. That's when you want to let them know, hey, this yep. is something that might be for you um, right. to help expand what you can read, because not everything is going to be available in large print. Right. Um, I don't know if you know if there's more things are available this way than large print. I would. I don't, I don't know for sure, but I would assume there probably are. Because you know, large print is. You know, it's a pretty expensive proposition. Yeah. Um, publishers kind of limit the number of titles that work with it. So. And this is a program that, as you said, has been around since the 30s doing right. this. So they've got, they're doing mm -hmm. it, yeah, not a problem. So it'll give them more options of things they can read. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, well, it doesn't look like anybody had any questions while we were chatting. So um, that's fine. Um, you just told them everything they need to know. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. Well, thanks for seeing me in the room, too. Yeah, like I like you mentioned, you haven't been on the show in a little while. Um, I think since they moved over to the West Wing, um, here at the Library Commission, we had we had three floors of office space, right. and talking about Grail was in our basement, and um, the space across the hall from us became available, and so they moved over there. Yeah, yeah, there was an important slide in the archives about that move. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, we had some. Uh, it was a big some, yeah, process. Yeah, nautical issues of sorts, I guess. Yes, the there's some so. water issues in the basement here, so we're not in there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're over across the hall. They have a windows now. It's very nice. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, the windows have really cheered us all up. It's been a couple years in the sun now. It's been, it's been great. <laughs> Everybody's been changed. So um, I think that we will, we will wrap it up then if nobody has any questions. Um, if you do need more information, go to our website, look for, um, reach out to Scott and anyone who's talking to the Braille service and we can get you set up with anything at 
um, getting this um, to your library. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Scott, for walking across the hall here. <laughs> um, you hit escape, we'll get out of here. Oh, oh, there you are. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah there's an email. Yeah. 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 There's an email as well. So. <laughs> um, so that will wrap it for today's show. Um, I will show you um, Encompass Live. Our website is on um, here under um, education and training. There it is. Um, Encompass Live webcast, I call them here. But you can also type into, if you just use, use the keyword, type Encompass Live um, into oh, your um, browser of choice, um, search engine of choice. And so far in the world, we are the only thing called Encompass Live. I keep saying that. Cross my fingers, nobody else will ever <laughs> come up with this. So we come up with all your search results um, so that you can get to our website um, from there, um, either from the commission site or just by you know, searching for us. Um, we have our upcoming shows listed here, but um, our archives, as I said, I'll tell you, show you is right here. There's a link beneath our upcoming shows that has all of our previous shows here. Um, this is last week's shows about leading. Um, they had a few links to different things. We'll have our recording. Um, Scott slides um, will be listed here, um, so you'll be able to access that. Um, potentially later today, maybe tomorrow, um, everything will be processed and up to YouTube. Everyone who attended this morning or who registered for today's show will get an email and we'll um, announce it out on our mailing lists and um, Facebook page, Twitter, the usual places um, to let you know when the recording is ready to watch. Um, normally at this point, I would invite you to China, join us for next week's show, but we are not doing a show next week. Um, uh, Encompass Live is our weekly show. We are um, on 51 weeks out of the year, though. The one week we take off is when we have our state um, Nebraska Library Association and School Librarians Association annual conference. That's when we could take off because everybody's at conference. So um, we will not be on next week. Um, if you are attending, check out, go to conference. Um, you can register on site. So um, if you haven't pre registered, which pre registration was a few weeks um, ago, um, head out to Kearney if you didn't and um, show up and join us. As Scott mentioned, we have quite a few sessions from the Library Commission um, being done throughout the, the two days of the conference there. Um, we will also be doing a, um, having a makerspace demo area. Um, I believe it's going to be physically near where the exhibits are. We have a new um, Libraries um, Innovation Studios makerspace grant. We're going to putting makerspace type equipment into some libraries across the state over the next three years. We're going to have all that equipment at the conference to demo and show. You can try some of it, so you can just look at some of it, talk to people about what's going on with that. So heading to conference. Um, but our next show will be about ALA's Book Club Central. If anyone has heard about this, this is the one where um, Sarah Jessica Parker is now involved and connected with ALA and doing recommending book um, books for a book club. Um, there's going to be more information. I'm still I'm working with Beth Nowinski, who is the person in charge at ALA with this or um, the Book Club Central, about who she might be getting on the show with us, some publishers, some authors. Um, that week that this show is actually happening, which is October um, 18th, is when they are going to be announcing their next book in um, this in the in the um, program. The first title. Um, here, no one is coming to save us was the first title that they did, which was um, earlier this year. Um, but they're going to be announcing the next pick um, that week, so hopefully we'll have all that on the show. So if you're interested in ALA's Book Club Central and what um, Sarah Jessica Parker thinks we should read, <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead and sign up for that one and any of our other future shows that we have here. Um, I've got some November dates booked. I've got other ones um, on finalizing, so look for updates here as, as I get the, everything nailed down for the upcoming months. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. We uh, post um, announcements of when new shows are coming up. Here I had a reminder of today's show that people could log in on the fly. When the recordings are available, I post on here as well, so um, if you are on Facebook and you use it to um, keep up with things, head over there and give us a like. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning's show. There we go. Make sure I call back. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you in two weeks on Encompass Live. Bye bye.